thanks for, for giving me the opportunity of being here since I couldn't make it for that other invitation a couple, couple of years ago. So, and thanks to all of you for being here. I know it's late in the evening. I know we've just changed clocks over this weekend and it's cold and we all just want to go home. So I very much appreciate you making the time for, for being here. So I'm going to try to divide uh, my presentation in three parts. We're going to first see quite quickly why all these renewed appetite uh, for working with cities, why suddenly there is a bit of an epiphany out there about cities being important actors to, to play with. Then we're going to take a crash course on these global agendas. We're going to particularly stop at the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development and, and its SDGs. And we're going to then take a quicker tour of the new urban agenda that was adopted one year ago, more or less, in Quito, in Ecuador, during the Habitat Key Conference. And last but not least, we're going to stop for a little while, uh, trying to provoke a bit some thoughts, and we're going to look at the challenges ahead, some building blocks for implementation and what are the challenges ahead. So that's, that's the way I'm going to try to, to, to make it happen. Of course, at any given moment you have any burning question, I don't mind at all being interrupted. I also understand that we have good time for discussion afterwards and I very much look forward to that. So I really call on you to not to be shy and to really, you know, use, use my thoughts just as in the same vein, provoking your own thoughts, not just as gospel. And then let's have a yeah, vivid conversation and contradict me as much as you want, please. So, okay, just starting with that. I don't need to say, I'm pretty sure, for how long have cities been out there and have existed as a form of community and human organization. But we can trace it back to, 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 to many, 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 many centuries, as much as humankind actually exists, probably. But what is, what is new about it? What, what is it in this phenomenon that is making it so interesting right now for everybody to, uh, to look at and to work on? Well, scale. Look at the top there of the slide. So from the 50s to today, we've moved from 30% of urban population worldwide to what is now considered 54%. And in two decades, three decades, we're really going to go up as high as 66%. And that increase of the urban population is going to happen particularly not in Europe, not in Latin America. We are quite fairly urbanized here, and Latin America is also predominantly urbanized by now. But the bulk of it is going to be, as you can see there, in Africa and in Asia. What has happened as well over the past decades, it's an eclosion of megacities. Cities that in some occasions, as for Tokyo, you can see there, they actually host more, more population than some countries. Tokyo actually has more souls living there than Canada. So that's one of the things that have changed over the past decades, the scale at which urbanization has been occurring. Because of that scale and that magnitude, what cities are good at is at agglomerating, at concentrating. And sometimes they don't concentrate just good things. They actually exacerbate programs. And they exacerbate them because they also interlink them. Because we see social, environmental, economic unrest coming together in cities. And we have issues around poverty, about inequality, about informal settlements, food systems, connections with the rural world, rural urban linkages. We see oppressed issues around civic engagement, violence, lack of jobs, all that is very familiar to us, isn't it? We also have the environmental components of it that relate, well, to pollution, waste management, health, environmental or human health. And all that, when actually, still today, cities are only occupying 2% of the land. But they are responsible, as we can see down there, for some figures that you're probably quite familiar with. Another thing that has also occurred over the past decades, and perhaps is a bit more acute in Euro for Europeans, for, for, for our quiet life and easy life as Europeans, is everything that's got to do with migration and displacement. But actually, that's been going on for a while. It's not just because Europe right now is experiencing something that is considered as a peak of migration, that other continents and other regions of the world have not been experiencing internal displacement for many decades. Take a look at Africa, for instance. And part of that migration has been a rural to urban migration as part of this increasing scale of urbanization that we were talking about. And that results in informality. That results in people living in conditions like that. Informal settlements, slums. Behind that reality, there's also the reality of evictions. Be people being kicked out overnight of their houses because of no security of land, property or land tenure. No property rights at all whatsoever. There's also the economic dimension of informality. 
something that is still today very difficult for us to grapple with, and that is quite a component of nowadays urbanization, the broad urban economy, as it's put in positive terms, or the informal economy. So this is it. This is the picture over the past uh, decades, if you want, over the recent decades. But why this growing recognition? Suddenly, it's not that somebody woke up one day and realized that uh, we have to work with cities to fix all these problems. It's many decades of a lot of work by different sectors of civil society, by different professions, part of it actually led by academia, luckily. Um, we've came to this realization. I'm not going to stop on the graphs because I am going to leave the slides behind and I'm super happy for them to be distributed as you, as you best see fit. But basically the realization is that we've understood that urbanizing is not equal to sustainable urban development. We've finally realized that indeed urban growth has a positive impact on economic development, but per se alone is not going to actually bring prosperity, is not going to bring equality, is not going to bring environmental protection. And that is a bit of the change. That's a bit the epiphany moment that has been occurring. Um, we've also understood another thing. We've understood that the global challenges we are facing today, which relate to displacement, relate to conflict, relate to environmental problems, relate to inequality, they relate to the lack of connection between politicians and civil society, all of that at the end of the day, is played not in the vacuum of geopolitics, but in the reality of communities and cities where people actually live. So we finally understood that we can actually use urban transformation and its unprecedented scale to fix some of the global challenges and turn them into opportunities at the very local level. We've also understood that Cities have got a series of characteristics that actually enable them to be agents of that transformation. There's different theories, a lot of, a lot of scholars are writing about it, a lot of decision makers have also come out quite, quite, quite clearly about it. I've just taken here the latest World Cities report in 2016 produced by UN Habitat, and as you can see they are pinpointing at four specific elements that they consider um, to, uh, make cities enablers for that transformation. They are talking about their economic dynamism, how they actually, cities in transition, create that economic dynamism. They are highlighting the, the, the evolving spatial form that cities can take. They are also highlighting the capacity to cities, of cities to address environmental problems. They not only create them, but they can actually be places where we can address them. And they are particularly highlighting as well technology and what information that the scale producing cities generated by citizens, including big data, is actually making cities be enablers of that transformative development. I could be very unfair to the big networks of local and regional governments who over many decades have actually championed the role of cities, if I didn't mention them, as actually also another driver, another, another big force that over the past decades has actually helped Politicians, decision makers, the United Nations system, the international community realize about this potential of cities and, and local governments. Great, so we know more or less where we are. We know why this increased attention, we know the potential, the risks behind it, and the opportunities as well. Let's take now a crash course at the agendas. And it's a crash course, it's a, a lot of information, it's information overload, so apologies for that from the onset. I'm going to skip some of the slides in the understanding that then you could be uh, able to access them at your own ease. And um, at the last slide, you got my email address, so you're always very, very free to shoot an email and, and I'll be super happy to, to, to respond. So let's go slowly, but at the same time, let's keep a bit of a, of a pace here. So 2015, the year, <laughs> a transformative year. Why? Because actually... <laughs> It could take us very, very long. We would have to go many, many decades back in time in international relations to find such a fruitful year for treaties. Not treaties, sorry, wrong word, for international agreements. It could take very, very many decades to go back and find something like this. And still, we would not find the thread that unites all this, which is the notion of sustainable development. So what is all this? Well, you got in the center of it, the Sustainable Development Goals, so the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, adopted by heads, and state, uh, of, of, uh, heads of state and government in September 2015, after a very long, 
negotiation process over quite some years with unprecedented levels of engagement by different sectors of civil society. Um, we also have the Paris Agreement on Climate Action, December 2015. Quite an agreement. Quite an agreement because of the first time ever that actually nations of the world are committing to staying below the two degrees Celsius. Something that is actually a commitment they've acquired. They have not necessarily committed in strong terms to how they're going to get to that reality, but at least they've committed to that in hard law, which is something, a notion we're going to see afterwards. But in between those two big agreements that make the headline news and are quite known to all of us, we actually had two other things. We had in April the same year in Sendai, in Japan, we renewed the global framework for disaster risk reduction and, and, well, the framework that tells us how to actually deal with risk prevention and how to deal with it when it's impacting on us and how to minimize life losses and economic loss out of it and how to prevent it if possible. In July the same year, we had the agenda called Financing for Development. It was adopted in Addis Ababa. And what is that agenda? Well, that agenda is quite a critical thing. It doesn't make the news, but it's basically the theatre where the global north and global south geopolitics are played in terms of monies, in terms of how much money, what type of financial frameworks, what type of capacity building, technology transfer is going to happen in order to finance development. It should have been the financial component of the Sustainable Development Goals. It has not. Perhaps it has fallen short. And it has certainly fallen very short in terms of harnessing the urban age. But still, it's there and still is going to be a very important agenda that is going to be used by the so-called Global South to take accountable, to take the Global North accountable when it comes to implementing the SDGs over the next decades. And what happened in 2015 as well is that we were getting ready, making quite a lot of progress towards the adoption of the new urban agenda in, in Habitat 3, which as I said was, was in October 2016 in, in Quito, Ecuador. But don't you think that this happens overnight? And this is the consequence of decades, decades of work, decades of hard work by many uh, convinced champions who actually, some decades ago, probably before many of us in this room were born, were fighting for the notion of sustainable development to be understood as the only possible way for humankind to develop. And also, if we got to Habitat 3 last year in October, is because before Habitat 3, we had Habitat 2 and Habitat 1. So you can see a bit there how this all maps out. It's quite a lot of decades. And I'm pretty sure that when the Brundtland Commission published the Brundtland Report back in 87, they, they were dreaming of it, but they were certainly not sure that one day the global agenda for human development could be an agenda based on sustainability, on that paradigm shift. And that is what has happened, actually, with the SDGs. The FDGs, the SDGs are the, the kind of final destination, if you want, of all those decades of pushing for this notion of sustainability for human development that places economic, social and environmental dimensions on, on equal food. You probably know very well that what happens with these agreements is that countries can walk out and nothing happens. Well because there is a difference between what is called hard law and soft law. All the literature there on the screen. Uh, any questions? Happy to take them. The difference and the nuance of why Paris, the Paris Agreement, is sitting in between, uh, perhaps helping you understand all these news about Trump administration leaving uh, Paris. What does it actually mean in practical, way, in practical terms? What is it that the Trump administration can leave and what is it that they cannot actually leave? It's all the other agreements we've got there, the SDGs, the Sendai Agreement on Resilience, the Financing for Development Agenda of Addis Ababa, the SDGs themselves, all those are soft law. But let's not underestimate the power of soft law, please. Because soft law, as you saw in the previous slide, is something that takes decades to be built. It's something that is actually agreed by 196 countries, many times at war with each other, sitting all together in a place called the United Nations. As imperfect as the United Nations is, this is still today the only place where all these countries can come together and discuss certain things. 
And actually, the beauty of soft law, as we will see later on, is that it actually shapes the way in which countries plan and budget for their expenditure over decades. And that might not be certainly as strong as a treaty that gives you the opportunity of taking a country to court if they walk out from, but still, it's quite dramatic. Why is it quite dramatic? Back to my point of countries being at war with each other. Because behind getting to agree on soft law, we have all this. Reality check, multilateralism at play, geopolitics at its best, is a mess. You're going to get sick if you read that slide. But basically, what I got it there is to show you how geopolitics plays when you are in a United Nations room trying to figure out who is going to support or not an SDG on cities. You got to actually understand how are these different blocks going to work together? And what is it that each of them are going to be trading? Because even if you're talking about SDG 11 on cities, some of them are going to be talking about Palestine and Israel. Otherwise, they're going to be talking about trade. Otherwise, they're going to be talking... All of that is going to be in their minds, even if you are in a room where all you want to discuss is SDG 11 on cities and human settlements. So that is the reality check. Another reality check that explains why soft law is something that is not to be neglected is because we also have this behind. Already quite some decades ago, back in 1992 at the Earth Summit, the original Rio Summit, it was understood that we would never get to sustainable development if we didn't bring along civil society. The sustainable development as a paradigm shift that it is was about changing the way in which society is organized and operates. And therefore, member states of the United Nations open nine channels of engagement of different sectors of civil society, which are called the nine major groups. You've got them listed there, and you can already see shyly mentioned local authorities. A couple decades later, when we go to the so-called Rio Plus 20 summit in 2012, well, there is a bit of realization that, A, in the past two decades, things have changed. Others, uh, other sectors of civil society have emerged. And as you can see, local communities, grassroots communities, volunteer groups, migrants and families, all the persons and persons with disabilities joined the previous list of the nine major groups composed by women, children and youth, indigenous peoples, NGOs, workers and trade unions, business and industry, scientific and technological community, farmers, and local authorities. Where do scholars sit in these nine major groups? And academia in the scientific and technological community. It's not always to the, to the liking of, of everybody involved, but that's where, um, that's, that's where when David goes to the United Nations and he's given the opportunity of speaking on behalf of that, nine, that, that particular major group is where actually there's a lot of strength because you're engaging officially with the official channel that the United Nations is giving you, and you are sitting behind that flag that says scientific and technological community, and you are representing the knowledge base in these in this, uh, intergovernmental negotiations. So here we go. We get to the SDGs, to this amazing agenda. Ambitious, as one can dream it. Universal, because it's actually an agenda for the whole world. Integrated because the list of 17 SDGs is not conceived in silos, but understanding that economic, environmental and social concerns intertwine and pose integrated challenges and opportunities. And basically an agenda that has as a motto not to leave anyone behind, but because it's a sustainability agenda, it's actually no one, no place and no ecosystem to be left behind. And that is the dramatic change, that is the paradigm shift that this agenda is actually putting forward. Why are they important to you, the SDGs? Why, besides generously using your evening time to come and listen to a lecture on the SDGs and the global agendas, why can they be useful to you in the next decades? Because they're actually going to be the compass for many professions in the next two decades, until 2030. Uh, is actually when we are supposed to be meeting these, uh, these SDGs. If you take countries, well, as I was saying, countries around the world are actually coming up with national plans, programs and budgets to implement these SDGs. Programs and plans that are then uh, reviewed annually at the United Nations. So a bit of light is shed on them annually at the United Nations. Some countries are actually being extraordinarily good at involving their civil society, their academia, and even the private sector in the elaboration of these national plans. 
regions and cities, so uh, regional and local authorities, they actually play in a huge part. And, and Katarina will later on show us what, what do we mean by all these with the so-called localization movement. But they are also joining this movement of trying to bring the reality of the SDGs to their particular uh, communities. And many are the regions and the cities that are orienting their decentralized cooperation programs to this new reality. Um, if you talk about national development uh, agencies, philanthropies, charities and multilateral donors, this is their one agenda. This is their mainstream agenda that is actually framing all the use of their funds. If you talk about NGOs, well, it's a sustainability paradigm. It's no longer development NGOs on one side and environment NGOs on the other side, fighting to camps, fighting for money. It's not supposed to be that anymore. Is supposed to be economic, social, and environmental concerns on equal foot. The private sector, as smart as they are, they are not only seeing the business opportunity behind it, but they are also championing it. Quite a f uh, there's quite some cha champions in the in the in the private sector, and they are funding a lot of activities behind it. And academia, luckily, is still there, interrogating some key questions like what do we mean about disintegration. Um, what do we mean about localizing? What do we mean for the di di frameworks that are actually required? They are generating academia and knowledge base, and also, extremely importantly, they play a phenomenally important role in the monitoring and the review, in the accountability of this agenda, with the neutrality that one expects from, from academia. So, crash course, an integrating agenda. We move from the MDGs, which were eight, to the 17 SDGs. We moved from looking at the symptoms of an ill well to actually trying to identify what are the ill causes of, a, of, a, of an ill world. So the 17 SDGs have got in total 169 targets. And in theory, to the best of the ability of an intergovernmental process between countries which are at war with each other many times, to the best of that ability, the 169 targets try to be the identification of the root causes of those illnesses that we are suffering. As, as humankind. Um, to the best of the ability of an intergovernmental process, there was an initial phase in which there was quite a conscious exercise of recollecting a knowledge base and calling on different sources of knowledge to try to understand why, why these illnesses and what could be its root causes. And certainly, I think that compared to what we, could, we, with, we saw during the MDGs era, there is an appetite, a true appetite, to keep the link open with academia and with sources of knowledge and science over the years of implementation of the SDGs and during the monitoring milestones of the, of the SDGs. Um, well, paradigm shift, transforming our, our, our societies, an ambitious call to end poverty, uh, to fight inequality, to tackle climate change, and to do all that guaranteeing peaceful societies to absolutely everybody. Um, and within that paradigm shift, as we say, the recognitions that cities are drivers for that transformation and places of opportunity. Perhaps one of the most important things about this agenda that is difficult to grapple with for us Europeans is its universality. The MDGs were an agenda for the developing countries. Or an agenda based a bit, if you want, on the global north and global south dynamics. An agenda by which the rich north could be given money to the supposedly poor south to help them develop and grow and prosper. The SDGs are no longer about that. The SDGs actually look at all those 17 challenges and acknowledge that there's not a single country in the world free from challenges relating to one of those. Basically, what the SDGs do is that they are applicably in a, in a universal context to absolutely every single country, and they kind of place all countries as developing countries. One country might be needing to develop a lot on gender equality, while being extraordinarily good at environmental protection, while being tremendously poor on water and sanitation, while being very bad at education. So. There's for everybody, <laughs> there's homework for everybody there. And that is actually one of the most inter interesting um, and challenging notions that we have to, to come up with. Understanding that every single country, when confronted to those 17, is at a given moment a developing country. Um, important about 
these agenda, as well as we were saying, is that there was an unprecedented level of engagement by stakeholders in civil society, equally by some national governments, considering as, as well their role as key implementers, um, and multi-stakeholder partnerships, something very fashionable. As an integrated agenda, where all these 17 SDGs have got challenges that are actually interconnected, is only going to be implemented if we realize that we're going to have to work together and work differently. The notion of multi-stakeholder partnerships is very easily said, but then it gets very complex, because when you talk about cities, it also requires you to look very carefully, for instance, at public-private partnerships and how they serve or do not serve, at times, public utilities and services. So, SDG 11. I think, that David, you were very generous when you were you know, presenting uh, what I did during the negotiation years, but uh, it would have been absolutely impossible to get to SDG 11 without the concerted effort and, and the very generous collaboration between different, many different actors. There was something that was called the Urban SDG Campaign, where, where some of us were proudly, very proud to be part of. It's a campaign that was launched really under the auspices of SDSN, so you know, kudos for them for having the idea. And yeah, Mistra, Comunitas, many of the networks of local governments, we all joined and it was the, the opportunity, what gave us the opportunity of showing to um, the nations who were negotiating the agenda that SDG 11 was not just the dream of local governments, but it was actually a maltext they hold the call something that was perceived as a, multi as, as a need for the 21st century by a multiplicity of actors, not just by local authorities wanting to potentially play to their self-interest. SDG 11 on its targets. Look at these with political eyes. Try not to look at it with the eyes of science, of knowledge, or not even with the eyes of a citizen, in the sense that it is, it is a political agreement. It's got targets on, on, on housing, public services and slums, on transport, on the environmental footprint on, of cities, on the spatial form of cities, on public spaces, on rural urban linkages, on how do we come up with integrated policy and, and, and planning, and then something particularly related to the least developed countries, how do we support them in building resilient buildings. When you look at it with the eyes of a citizen, there's a few things there you're going to see missing. If you look at it with the eyes of, a, of academia, you're going to go like, oh my god, particularly if you read many of the targets. No, you're going to go like, oof, some of this can be a bit inconsistent, can be a bit incoherent, cannot be state of the art in terms of the latest knowledge available. It's the product of a political agreement. And still, over the next two decades, it's going to actually mark the boundaries where, for instance, national development agencies are going to be spending their money on. There's a few things there that might shock you, you know, but uh, very happy to have a conversation afterwards on what is it that is shocking you there. Um, I'm going to take one that is not particularly shocking, but just to tell you a political story. 11.A on rural urban linkages and, and regional development. It would have been simply impossible to have SDG 11 today as part of the 17 had that target not been listed. Because basically, when one was trying to convince countries uh, to have an SDG 11, to consider having a focus on cities in this modern contemporary agenda for human development, the first thing they could tell you is like, okay, but if we have an SDG on cities, then we need an SDG on rural areas. And you could get trapped in this almost never-ending dichotomy that separates rural areas from, rural, uh, from urban areas and that doesn't understand that over the past couple of decades, the scale of urbanization has actually made rural urban linkages a mutual interdependence between rural and urban areas. And in many continents, there's no separation as such. For the Africans, for instance, there is a whole kind of rural urban continuum. They cannot actually separate in many occasions where there's a city, a, a settlement that is urbanized to start from a settlement that is a bit more rural. Um, probably you see a couple of things missing there. You're thinking about like, okay, so where are the governments? Where are local and regional governments, which are supposed to be the closest level of government to the citizens? Where they couldn't be there. Because had we actually pushed to have them there, some nations could have understood uh, SDG 11 as the back door by which some movements were trying to push for decentralization. And as you can imagine, some countries in the United Nations 
are not particularly pro decentralization. They don't want to necessarily transfer more powers or more budget to their uh, subnational spheres of government. You also see something hugely missing from there the economic dimension of cities. There's, there's hardly nothing that, of course, you can, you can see the economic connections behind all those things, but you don't see the word economy there, the productivity of cities, when we actually know that, um, as we saw earlier, 70% of the GDP worldwide is produced by urban centers. So why is it not there? Because it was negotiation. A couple of things had to get out. At the same time, let's not forget that this is an integrated agenda. So when I talk about cities, and I really want to make them work, I'm going to have to be taking economic decisions that would eventually impact on industry, innovation and infrastructure. They could impact on decent work and economic growth. They could impact on many of the SDGs that, which have got a much more economic connotation than what SDG 11 ended up with. In order to monitor how we are going, checking against delivery, how are we going? We're going to be implementing these over the next uh, yeah, decades, until 2030. Well, at the global level, um, nations came up with the realization that we needed a set of indicators, as much as we had a set of indicators for the MDGs. And that is something that has been negotiated by the national statistical offices of the countries. And they've came up with a set of, of, yeah, of indicators, 240 right now, for the overall 169 targets of the agenda, and they are divided in three groups. I'm going to get a bit geeky here, but just for the sake of showing you how this agenda is actually a learning curve for absolutely everybody, because we have what is called Tier 1, Tier 2, and Tier 3 indicators. Tier 1, the world is pink and glossy and super easy. We have everything. We have the methodology, we have the, the standards, we have uh, the reliability of the information collected on the regular basis we need. Tier 2, things start getting complex. We have some of that, but we actually do not have the regularity of, of data at the, at the level of sample, at the width of sample we actually need. And Tier 2, ouch, we don't have anything. But we have the willingness of having it, <laughs> and certainly, uh, hopefully, the ability to test it over the next years. So some of those indicators that you will see, because they are publicly available and, and consult, right now are going to really move a lot. And as you can see, for instance, for, for SDG 11, with all these targets that we were seeing here, on this particular topic that we were seeing here, we only have one tier one indicator. So the world is glossy and pink only for one indicator. Right now, we can only measure with certainty one of those targets. Which one is it? Come on, quick guess. Give me a couple of... Uh, and what is it that, on all those topics there? And what is it that you think that we have enough data that is reliable enough right now? She got it. Is that one? Because the world, the World Health Organization has been setting up standards of particular uh, matter in the air for so many years that at least some cities, at least the mega cities across the world, are collecting it. That is the only. Certainty, <laughs> that is the only target for which we right now have got enough data. So a lot of work from academia here, a lot of areas from which you could be actually helping and working, and a big challenge for local authorities, for local governments to collect all that data, when actually many times their data uh, is not necessarily looked at by, by the federal governments. So let's keep on moving, because that is the set of indicators at the global level. But we have understood that these agendas, these SDGs, are not going to be anything unless we take them to the local level. And we have to take to the local level not just the targets, but also the data for monitoring them, also the indicators. So is the, there is the hope, therefore, that besides these global indicators, there'll be a constellation of indicators that will relate to regions of the world, that will relate to national uh, realities and to local realities. Challenges there are clear. Disaggregating this data by all, uh, per all social and economic groups, disaggregating it as well at the right territorial level, moving away from using just household census, like knocking on everybody's door and asking them how many guys are living here, and actually trying to use GIS, 
geospatial information technologies to help us get a bit better granular picture of what is happening there. And challenges as well around reconciling the, the, the reality of, of nowadays on technology. Like besides government data, we also have the realities of big data and of citizen generated data. I'm going to skip these three. They are there for you. It's just the list of indicators. I thought it would be perhaps interesting for everybody to see how the indicators uh, correlate. And when you read them, if you read them, you will realize that um, there's been a lot of movement. Some indicators were in one place and then suddenly they realized that they didn't have enough data. So instead of being tier one or tier two, they've dropped to tier three. So the world is not pink at all. Piloting and localizing all this is a tricky thing. Hopefully, and luckily, there's been some champions, and you can be very proud, uh, and you should be very proud to know that Urban, um, I mean, Mr. Urban Futures was actually one of those champions. Uh, before the SDGs were negotiated, David and his team were actually piloting these targets that were still in the process of being negotiated uh, to see how the targets of the SDG 11 would resonate, if at all, <laughs> with cities across the world. And you found that they were not resonating at all. <laughs> and you were smart enough and quick enough in the space of just some months of testing that on the ground to go and take it to the intergovernmental process that was going on. And part of those findings were taken. So even a political process, as a highly politicized process, could take up and was willing to take up some of the findings that were coming up from, from a relatively short pilot that could only operate within some time. But I'm not going to step on, on what Katerina is going to be presenting afterwards, probably on what we can discuss over the discussion. But just to let you know that, um, luckily, there was academia out there and cities out there which were ready to start piloting and helping localize all these agendas over um, the past uh, past few years. And I am personally super excited to see what's going to come out of the next phase in the next two years, because that's, that next phase is trying to, to bring together the SDGs and the new urban agenda, something that nobody has done. Actually, uh, the new urban agenda didn't succeed necessarily to kind of place itself um, as, a, as a conduit for delivering the SDGs. And apparently that's what you're going to try in the next few years. So I really look forward to, to seeing what's going to come out of that. So an agenda with 17 SDGs, an SDG 11 with its targets, a series of indicators at a global level, the understanding that we need indicators that are much more granular at different levels, and a review process at the global level again, trying to shed some light on these on a regular basis. So there's going to be annual progress reports they are interesting reading, for as much as a UN thick report can be. They are a bit disheartening for the SDG 11 community, because they do show that mm -mm, things are not going well. And they are kind of so, so disheartening to the localization movement, because they show a huge appetite by many cities to localize, but a difficulty of how to do that and how to go about it and how to land all these stratospheric global agendas in the reality of their communities. There is an annual meeting. Anything in the UN has to be a high-level meeting. So there is a high-level meeting. It's a, a political forum. For those of you who are a bit more familiar with the UN system, it's actually what continues the Sustainable Development Commission. Over, over the years, and it reviews on an annual basis different SDGs. And next July, July 2018, it will be reviewed SDG 11 for the first time. So we will have countries reporting on how they are doing uh, on the implementation of SDG 11 for the first time. The work on the indicators continues through the United Nations Statistical Commission that meets also annually. And then, Again, we also have reviews by other multilateral organizations, by civil society and by academia, which are sometimes called the shadow reporting, but they are they are actually the ones that tend to shed a lot of light, even if they're called shadow reporting. So from the SDGs, we move to the new urban agenda. Yet another paradigm shift. I know it's becoming very boring to hear about paradigm shifts. Everybody seems to be shifting and there's all, there seems to be a, a new paradigm every six months. But actually, the new urban agenda did bring one. It did bring the realization that in that scale of urbanizing over the past decades, uh, cities have morphed, have really expanded, have created urban corridors, they've turned into city regions, and the notion of rural urban continuum is, is much more present than what it was perhaps back in Habitat too. 
So the paradigm shift here is a vision for cities and human settlements that are capable of fulfilling their territorial functions across and beyond administrative boundaries. So think about food systems, for instance. The food we are eating here is probably not produced on this very uh, city centre. It's probably coming from rural areas. Think about when we open the tap, the water that is there. Think about all those rural urban connections that are uh, measured in terms of um, uh, flows of people, flows of resources, economic flows, and so on and so forth. A bit of a crash, um, um, crash course again. Um, a big movement during the new urban agenda for embracing that epiphany that urbanization is not enough to guarantee prosperity, equality, and environmental protection, and that we actually need to move to sustainable urban uh, 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 development. And a series of commitments that actually try to look into those three dimensions of sustainability. Um, the identification of a series of enablers that should be able to harness the potential behind urban development, national urban policies, laws, institutions, governance, local fiscal systems, the strength of spatial planning, so, so how the form of cities can lock them in in pervasive patterns of development or can actually help them prevent those pervasive patterns. The idea that services and infrastructure are part of a human rights discourse, the provision of services to everybody, the, 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 the need to embrace the broad urban economy taking into consideration the informal economy, a renewed commitment, let's see what it ends in the next decades, but a renewed commitment to empower local and regional governments in order to achieve multi-level governance in, a, in an effective manner. And certainly the understanding that the new urban agenda should be guiding the efforts of a multiplicity of sectors and actors over the next decades, um, grounding the work for policies that hopefully will, um, will have impact beyond, uh, beyond the next two decades and encouraging multi-stakeholder partnerships. A series of key documents that you might want to have a look into that have been actually um, on the left side, things that have come up since, since Quito, a bit of a framework for countries to know how to get about it. A very recent publication from September 2005, uh, this year, which I think is quite an interesting one, is a compendium of, of rural urban linkages, ten entry points, including food systems, for instance, and some examples about how to make that uh, happen. And on the right side, things that already existed prior to Habitat 3, and they are being kind of re-channeled towards, towards that. A review system as well at the global level, so a progress report like for the SDGs. The first progress report of the new urban agenda is expected for spring next year. Um, a mechanism to feed the progress on the new urban agenda into that high-level meeting that annually reviews the SDGs. Uh, of course, the standing reviews and reports by UN Habitat, the uh, program of the United Nations that it's in charge of looking uh, to cities and, and human settlements, including their global observatory on, on urban matters, and the foremost, the world foremost conference on urban matters is the World Urban Forum, and it's actually taking place in February next year. So as you can see, we will have a gathering of the urban family in February next year, then we will have the first progress report of the new urban agenda in spring, and then we will go to July, in which the SDG 11 is going to be reviewed for the first time. So quite an interesting sequence of months to take stock on how these agendas are progressing, if at all, at the local level, and a bit of recalculation moment, and hopefully a lot of input from knowledge base, solid and, and, and reliable knowledge base. So I'm coming to the last part of my presentation here. Realization that cities are, or can be, a transformative force, global agendas that try to recognize that, a series of mechanisms to help enable monitoring, to help uh, enable garnering all the, all the forces and all the actors. Okay, but now we have to make this happen. And there is, yeah, building blocks for implementation to get started, but there's also significant challenges ahead. I've tried to group them in three. And this uh, an absolute brainstorm of ideas. I've tried to group them. Uh, first group is intellectual, academic, professional challenges. Then there is a group about enabling environments, enabling environments being of financial nature, institutional nature, regulatory nature. And then the challenges that relate to accountability and citizen ownership, which are extraordinarily important as well. 
intellectual, academic and practice. Well, let's not take for granted that in the 21st century we have a notion of urban, of city, that is actually not universally applicable, but at least adaptable. And it's been, actually this has been one of the critical problems behind coming up with indicators for some of the targets of SDG 11, that not the whole world uses the same notions. Let me just give you um, one of the ways in which India, until very recently, was defining what was urban as opposed to what was rural. In India, until very recently, a settlement was considered urban depending on the percentage of men employed in jobs out of the agriculture sector. A notion that perhaps nowadays is not, you know, very significant, significant to, to, to defining uh, uh, an, urban, an urban space. An intellectual challenge that we are facing here is breaking the silos in which we work without losing depth and technical ability. Because many times it's very easy to break the silos to staying at the helicopter level, but it's much more difficult to break them without losing depth and rigor in our, in our work. Part of it, cross-disciplinary approaches, data analysis, scenarios thinking. Um, how are we going to really use and understand the urban and the territorial lens as accelerators for implementing all the other SDGs. How are we going to contaminate with an urban dimension all those other SDGs so we live too to the idea of an agenda that is interconnected as the world is, as our reality on a daily basis is. Um, are we going to start understanding informality, which is actually the dominant pattern of urbanization in many places across the world? A bit more beyond is like causes and effects. Are we really going to start looking a bit at the patterns and the interactions of informality? The land use problems we have behind it, the impacts on planetary boundaries. Um, on data, we spoke about the challenges we've got there. Um, but let me take the last ones. Are we going to learn and teach about sustainable urban development differently? to what we're, we have been doing over the past decades. Because fundamentally, what we have from the intellectual perspective here is not a challenge of doing more of what we've been doing over the past decades, it's of doing differently. And doing differently means that you learn and are taught also in a different manner than what you've been over the past decades. And we still have the challenge of making sure that knowledge makes it all the way to practice, passing through the bottleneck of politics that is decision making. So the science, policy practice interface is still going to be quite a challenge. Some ideas on challenges for enabling environments, legal, policy and financial. Well, the urban and the territorial approach to implementing all this, the piloting and the adapting the SDGs and, and what we've been discussing earlier. The fact that it, it has been proven by several studies that 60% of the 169 targets of the SDGs can only be implemented with and by local and regional governments. But all that is calling for new arrangements at the national and at the subnational level. Arrangements of political governance and fiscal nature. Uh, because when you take some of the figures of the per capita, so the dollars per capita that some city governments, that some local governments across the globe have got to implement any work, is absolutely shameful. It's nothing is something that doesn't cover any of the needs of this agenda we are talking about. Of course, the big elephant in the room is decentralization of powers and budgets, and, and that's going to be a, a particularly tricky one, because it goes hand in hand with creating human, institutional and financial capacity in, in subnational governments. It's interesting to note as well that in the current world, with the current urbanization trend that we saw at the very beginning, the OECD estimates that less than 30 countries in the world have got something that we can call a national urban policy. A national urban policy being defined as something that, there's many definitions as authors, but being defined as something like a concerted, intentional approach to urban development carried out by a country, by a government at the national level, in a democratic manner, and engaging stakeholders engaged in civil society. Less than 30 countries in the world, and we are at a, an unprecedented rate of urbanization still today. A lack of attention to secondary cities, when actually in many, many places of the world they are the economic backbone. They actually account only for 40% of the GDP. We say that cities account more or less 70% of the global GDP. Secondary cities account only for 40% of the GDP but they actually provide more than 60% of the resources 
that we need in order to get to that 70% GDP provided by urban centers. So there is clearly a, 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 a clash there. There's clearly something that is not working out. Secondary city is also a different reality depending what you talk about. A secondary city in some countries is going to be 300k, but in China it can be 5 million. So there is a lot that we need to actually investigate about secondary cities and about flexible land governance systems and about informality as part of a notion of national urban policies. Something that we can really ask ourselves, those of us like me who are fascinated about geopolitics and international relations, is to what extent the United Nations is adapted and ready as a club of nations to learn from cities and from some national governments. In the understanding that it is a club of nations and should probably remain one. But how is the governance of the UN system, or how can the governance of the UN system be adapted in a way that we can actually tap into the reality and the knowledge of what local governments are doing with their communities in order to just harvest all that information and put it to the, uh, to the global service. Something that we still have to tackle again is the financial architecture for the urban age. Look at the very uh, bottom of that slide. He's telling us that an agenda as ambitious and universal as the SDGs are implies 600 new million jobs. Not jobs of any kind, because you have an SDG that tells you that it's decent work and economic prosperity. So productive jobs by 2030. And because we have a universal goal on poverty, a universal goal on many other things, and a universal goal on SDG 11 with a target on public services, this agenda also means universal provision of public goods and services to everybody within environmental limits. Basically, a multi-trillion dollar investment in urban infrastructure, housing and technologies. Why urban? Because the century is the urbanizing century. But the global financial architecture is not ready for that. And of course, on top of that, go and add a change in donor landscape and an absolute decline of the ODA, of official uh, uh, development assistance. I come to my last slide, which is the one that tries to give you some ideas on the challenges on accountability and citizen ownership. Let's not take for granted that everybody out there knows what the SDGs are. Actually, my parents didn't know until very recently, and I've been earning my bread with this for so many years. Implementation, monitoring, review, I mean, it could be absolutely meaningless <laughs> if it's not actually for us, for the citizens. And that is a battle that we're really going to have to keep on battling over the years because it has to be done with certain democratic uh, uh, um, definitions, isn't it? Gender equality and women's and girls' empowerment, of course, is part of the picture. And we have, again, the citizen-generated data and, and all that is behind it. Central to all this is that we should not forget that all these agendas are basically human rights agendas. This is what we're talking about at the end of the day. When we talk urban, there is also a movement that is particularly strong in Latin America that speaks about the right to the city. And even if we don't want to get into the complexities of the right to the cities, because it's not a human right, there are other things that relate to cities and to the informality of this scaled up urbanization trend that are very much linked to human rights. And that's, for instance, security of land tenure and property rights. It's linked to livelihoods. It's linked to shelter. It's linked to having a roof above your head that keeps you safe. Um, part of the challenges on accountability are going to be about reconnecting us with our politicians. A new social pact for trying to get to that uh, uh, reconnection in the understanding that local and regional governments are the first entry point for all of us to, to with government. Um, public uh, PPPs, I mentioned them earlier. And yeah, the multi-stakeholder and cross-sectoral partnerships that I also mentioned earlier. So thank you so much for your patience. I know it's been information overload, a lot of things there, but it's meant to provoke and it's meant to, you know, to keep provoking over months once I'm gone. That's the idea. Thanks very much.